You're based out of US, is it? Yeah, right now I'm in US. Okay. So can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. So if you can double yeah. your background. So yes, yes. I'll quickly go through my background. Uh, I have over seven years of experience in uh, service-oriented architecture and uh, BPM technologies. I work as a consultant for all two corporations. I worked on several projects uh, and as far as the training is concerned, we have been taking training since the last two years. We have uh, taken for almost like uh, 20 batches till now. So that's about a quick introduction and uh, I have told your what your expectations. So basically uh, what we cover here is uh, the service oriented architecture and the Oracle source with 11G. So we would be uh, covering all the concepts of uh, SOA. Uh, I mean, end of the course, you would be able to like uh, quickly pick up whatever requirement you have on Oracle Source with 11G. And as far as it comes to uh, web services, see, web service is something uh, which is uh, used to expose the underlying implementations. But as far as SOA is concerned, like we we use web services, no doubt in that. But everything is uh, are taking care by the tool. Okay, we don't develop the web services ourselves, like writing the WSGLs and all. Basically, we work with schemas, and then uh, it's more of the SOA concepts that we uh, cover in this rather than the uh, web service concepts. You you will understand it in a better way when uh, after we go through the introduction of uh, the SOA. Okay, maybe uh, by tomorrow. Uh, end of this session you will completely understand what we will learn in the course and what not. Okay. And uh, you're gonna, I mean, cover the people server also? Yes, yes. Yeah. We're going to cover all the concepts of SOA, so don't worry. Everything is covered. Uh, the web service doesn't come uh, under SOA, that's what uh, I meant, because uh, your expectation is to learn even web services, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, some uh, yeah, a little bit about that. Yes, uh, having a basic knowledge on web services is more than sufficient to be a SOA consultant because you never write web services. Web services are exposed for you by the actual Java developers or whatever uh, technology developers. We always integrate stuff. Okay, we always integrate the services. That's what a SOA consultant does. Okay, uh, coming to the course, maybe uh, anyways by the end of the course you will really understand what where web service really stands and how is it different from SOA. So basically what we have. use to develop uh, services in SOA? XML? Uh, it's definitely web service. Everything would be uh, converted to a web service finally. Okay, but the thing is uh, you never write the web services on your own. That's the point there. Okay. okay? Maybe uh, It's we, a we di diagrammatically, is it? That's what you want to do. Exactly. I mean, you just like exactly. a drop okay. yes, yes. That's great. Yes. Okay. A end of the two sessions, you will really understand the uh, difference between them. Maybe uh, this is the first time that you are looking at SOA, so you may have a little bit confusion. Because people often say, if you know web services, you will know SOA or vice versa. But it is uh, entirely uh, a wrong statement. Web service is something really different from SOA. Otherwise, why do we have SOA tools? Uh, we, would, we would have achieved the same thing with web services, right? So that's a different scenario altogether. Anyways, we'll come to that in the second session. So coming to the course, uh, this, so this is the course overview where we understand the principles of SOA. Uh, there are certain principles we would be going through that, and then we will realize all those principles using the SOA Suite 11 j which means we will do all the uh, uh, practical examples using various uh, components provided in the Oracle SOA Suite 11G. We would integrate services using various components in SOA Suite 11G. So obviously, as I told you, every component would be a web service, okay? but you would never write a web service. Either the Java developer or the tool would write the web services. We would just integrate things. The entire course would be for about 25 hours, typically one hour a day session and five days a week. So. I mean, sometimes the session may go up to one and a half hours. So uh, basically, it takes a month. Okay, taking uh, weekends into consideration, it takes a month. Each topic will be associated with a practical example, and participants are provided with all the session recordings. So it would be uh, for your future reference. 
and our site also has a number of blogs on various things so uh, you can ju just go through the blogs if you have any like uh, questions but uh, this would be handy after you complete the course draft not right now okay so what is that we would be uh, looking in this particular course see this course is completely on the oracle soa suite 11g so oracle's proprietary uh, soa product is soa suite 11g and it offers various components like mediators, adapters, business process execution language, which is the people which you're asking about, and then the human tasks, business rules, event driven architecture, HDO, BAM, etc. So these are various things. This would not make any sense for you right now. But anyways, end of uh, second session, you will have a, a clear picture on what each and everything is. Uh, the first two sessions would be completely introductory, uh, wherein uh, we provide you uh, an understanding on the SOA concept as well as what are the various components, what each and every component in this list does. Okay, and from the third uh, session onwards, we would be diving into the practical examples. So coming into the top base, what is SOA, what is service-oriented architecture? If someone asks me, I would say, SOA is an architectural style for building business applications using services that act as black boxes which can be orchestrated to define a specific business solution. Now this is a very big statement and obviously it would not make any sense for a beginner like you. So let's understand the same uh, concept in a layman terms, okay, and then we will map the same thing to the actual technical stuff. Okay, so what is SOA? In order to learn the concept, I will take a very simple example, okay, a simple bank example, banking corporation. Uh, how it evolved uh, during this uh, 30 to 40 years and what are the challenges it faces and finally how it would have uh, how, how it uh, overcome all those challenges so let's take this example of abc banking and co okay this is a very old bank so obviously initially there was no software everything used to be uh, done manually right so let's say this bank offers various services okay now service here means a specific business functionality like opening an account would be a function the, all these services are basically functional uh, what each and every box means a credit card uh, I mean giving a credit card would be a single service no doubt it would involve many things within that but basically I'm talking about the functionalities okay so let's assume this bank offers these six functionalities initially when it was established in the 1970s or so Okay, uh, so everything is manual, so obviously it would take so many, uh, so much of time and uh, uh, it would be error prone also obviously. So uh, it, during 1970s, uh, mainframe has come into the picture and it was so robust that m most of the banks have uh, uh, transferred their transactional things into mainframe. So even this bank followed the same thing. So let's assume the services 5 and 6 which form the core part of their business okay are uh, converted to the mainframe now they did not convert the other functionalities to mainframes because maybe the mainframe doesn't support it obviously you don't have a neat UI for, with a mainframe right and basically mainframe is for the transactional thing so obviously wherever you need transactions those stuff is basically uh, converted into the mainframe core so this is the picture right now where you have some four manual services and two automated services or software services so the communication, obviously everything is in the same enterprise, right? So you need an intercommunication at some point. So the two mainframe components who talk to each other seamlessly because they follow the same protocol. And when it comes to the manual services, it, it has to be a manual invocation with the other thing. So this is how the architecture looks like. But slowly as the customer base increased, like uh, we are going through the time, right? So say we are in 1990s. Okay, so the customer base has increased so much that the manual services, say service one is kind of a initial gateway, like opening an account. Okay, if the opening an account takes too much of time, then the other services are mostly idle, right? Because the first gateway is to open an account. So slowly as the customer base increased, the business found out this service one is becoming a kind of bottleneck and there has to be some solution to make it fast and the best solution is to optimize it right so say the service one 
is uh, written in Java. Okay, for some reason, maybe Java was uh, the evolving technology at that time. So maybe they have chosen Java to implement that functionality. Okay, everything is fine, but even now, uh, all these components are in the same enterprise, so they need a communication at some point, right? Say this component 3 needs a communication with component 1, but if it directly invokes, obviously, it would be incompatible. Why? Because they follow different protocols, different languages, obviously, they talk different languages, right? They cannot understand each other directly. So what is the way you can make them compatible? Maybe you can have a translator in between. See, one speaks German, one speaks French. Obviously, they cannot talk to each other directly, right? You need a translator who knows both the languages. Similarly, you need a communication layer, basically uh, a representation for the translator thing, okay, which takes care of the protocol transformations. Okay, say, so on top of each and every component, you put a intercommunication layer, okay, which takes care of uh, uh, converting the protocols. If it is Java to mainframe, maybe it uses some kind of code. Similarly, if it is Java to .NET, maybe it uses some other kind of protocol transformation. And for component 1 and 2, you observe it is a direct a seamless communication. For the other components and all, you need this extra layer. Okay, so this is the architecture. And slowly, as the customer base still increases, increases, say service 2 is also implemented and for some reason maybe it is outsourced to some company and it uses .NET. Okay, so it is implemented as a .NET component and obviously it needs an intercommunication layer and this top box that you see which is the intercommunication layer is not a single piece, it's basically a combination of various things like Java to .NET 1 package and then Java to mainframe. So it's basically a group of many protocol transformers. Okay, so this is how the architecture is, and say we are in 2000s, okay, with the advent of internet and all, the customer base has increased like anything, and you need more, and the competition also increased so much that you need to introduce new functionalities like reward points. Reward points was not there earlier. Now reward points, like, it's one of the major driving forces for any business, right? So similarly, maybe the banking would have so many services that it needs to introduce, okay? And it has to introduce to the existing things, right? It is not that it has to write something new and deploy it. It has to integrate with the earlier ones because everything is of the same enterprise, right? Uh, just a moment. Okay, uh, where am I? Okay, uh, we are talking about uh, the new requirements, right? So when the, uh, let's say the new requ suddenly the business comes up with a new requirement to the ID department saying there are so and so new functionalities that have to be added. Okay, and obviously it has to be software, not manual. And then uh, acquisitions is one of the latest trends, right? Instead of writing code from your from scratch, maybe you acquire another already existing uh, company and then you integrate that service. Similarly, even banks acquire other banks, other small banks. So obviously you need to uh, integrate those components with your components. And you never know what is the technology that they use. Maybe they use even a native technology, who knows. Okay. So basically, end of the day, you need to integrate their software components with your software components because right now, after much, everything is a single company, right? And say, and obviously, uh, you would not encourage any manual services in this age. So obviously, uh, all the remaining services also you need to implement a software component. So these are the new requirements to the IT department, okay? And this is a very huge task because, like, uh, because you need so many things uh, to be built up. So let's say. Uh, end of the day, your architecture would look something like this, where new components have come from acquisition, some components are newly written. If it is a newly written component, okay, we can directly uh, write it in the most robust technology such as a web service or all, web service and all. But if it is like an acquired component, you never know, it could be a native language, it could be in C, it could be in whatever technology. Correct. So end of the day, if you do uh, the integration in a traditional way, meaning integration means a communication 
between two different components. Okay, so if you do a con uh, integration in a traditional way, which you have been following all the last 40 years or so, your architecture would look something like this, wherein you have so many technologies, okay, and each component is talking to another component. Maybe the functionalities could be in such a way that each component requires some information from some other component at some point. So you need all the connection. Okay, so this is your architecture right now. Let's see what are the various problems with this particular architecture. Okay, the first thing that comes to your mind looking at the architecture is look at the number of lines that you have. Okay, these are basically the connections between different components. Correct. So there are so many connections, like if there are n components, the number of connections would be 2 power n minus 1, which is so huge. Okay, these are not physical connections, but basically these are the uh, like calls between each and every service that we are representing with a line. Okay, so there are so many calls that if there is any change somewhere, you need to make lot change, lot many changes. Why? Because here there are so many connections, right? Say component one is talking to component seven, so there is a direct communication here. There is a let uh, just a moment. Why am I not able to draw? Rajesh, are there? Rajesh? Rajesh? Okay. Yeah, fine. Now it's coming back. Okay. So let's uh, let's take this example wherein component one is talking to component 7. Okay. Now this is a very tightly coupled uh, environment because the components are directly talking to each other meaning a, a tight coupling means the service call for component 7 would have the address within the request header. Okay. Say this is address x where x is the address of component 7. And due to some reason let's assume that component 7 is moved to another server maybe uh, the load on this is very huge so it is moved to an XR data machine okay so obviously its host status changes right so it is Y now so when there is a change in the target component now this does not uh, this is not valid anymore you need to change the address in the request header okay so obviously what is the problem that you have a change in the target service is causing a change in the consumer service okay now let's assume uh, this is a this as a Visa credit card service and this as some shopping cart service. Okay, you may have so many services which uses credit card transactions. Now, if the Visa uh, credit card service, I mean whatever service it offers, if it changes and if it asks all its consumers to change, it doesn't work that way, right? Because there will be thousands of consumers and everyone has to change because your consumer uh, your uh, target has changed which is not a very good thing to do okay so obviously the tight coupling is one of the a major disadvantage that you have with this kind of architecture because a change in the target is making the change is uh, basically forcing a change in the source now in this case if you see it is being communicated with all the other components so a change in component 7 would invoke a change in all the components Though you don't have any changes in the other components, just for this tight coupling nature, you need to change each and everything, which is a very big uh, headache for the ID department. So that's one of the uh, disadvantages that we have. And look at the number of uh, connections that you have in this particular architecture. There are too many connections to manage, right? So obviously when there is a change, you need to change the connection details. And when you have more number, it would be much more difficult to maintain, right? So the number of connections is also one of the major problems or maybe we'll go through the slide which is better. Okay. So tight coupling is one problem and then you have the number of connections and one of the major problems in this particular thing is writing the intercommunication layer. Okay. See the functionality, yeah you have the technical expert 
in .NET. Yes, you give him the business requirements, he can implement it in .NET. Similarly, in Java or whatever. Okay, so writing a component is compulsory. You have to do it, and it's relatively easy because it involves only one technology, and you have so many resources in market to do it. So it's not very expensive also. But whereas coming to the intercommunication layer, this deals with a very low level code. Correct. Uh, and this intercommunication layer is not a single box. It's basically for dot .NET to Java, you would have a different set, and then for dot .NET to mainframe, you would have a different set. So it's basically the translator code that you need to write, which involves uh, very core level languages, and the number of resources that you have in this stream are very few. So obviously, it's very expensive. Correct. So writing the intercommunication, and obviously, it would take more time because there are as you have more technologies, it would take more time. So as and when the number of people, in, uh, number of technologies increase, the time taken to write this particular block would drastically increase. Correct. So basically, the IT department is finding uh, is finding it very difficult to write the intercommunication layer, which is basically kind of a boilerplate code. Your actual business is here, but you are writing this in order to communicate with the other things okay but the business would never understand this right business would always focus always they think in terms of we have such a small requirement why are you taking so long and why is it so expensive when you talk about the intercommunication layers and all they won't understand okay so it's not good for business as well as it's not good for IT also because they have to scratch their heads in order to write this code okay so this particular intercommunication layer problem is basically creating a headache both to the business as well as the IT department and because of this releases would get postponed or releases would get an, uh, I mean it would take more time so obviously if you don't have an, uh, a software component you're not giving business so you're not getting money so it basically a loss to both the departments okay so these are the various uh, disadvantages that you have with a traditional approach, okay? And you got into such scenario because you have, you don't, uh, you're not following the specific architecture uh, since start. Initially, you had one component, two components. You are happy with it, but slowly, as the time passes and you have more and more components, suddenly you realize that there are so many disadvantages. So if you talk about the limitations, whatever we talk now more time is taken to develop the intercommunication layer rather than implementing the business logic which is basically uh, giving a greater IT business gap okay meaning business expects something in some time and IT could not deliver because of various reasons that we discussed and then you have this tightly coupled nature between the interacting components and then the direct interaction obviously would make maintenance a nightmare and look at the number of connections it's almost 2 power n minus 1 connections which is very huge and to this architecture, even a simple extension would actually require too many changes because you need to write the code, which is obvious, you need to do it. And then the major problem comes, which is the layer. Okay. So even a simple extension would take would involve so much that it is very expensive and very uh, kind of uh, time taking process okay so because of which everything is highly expensive so obviously a business both business and IT has to come out of this particular architecture so what are the various um, solutions that we have so the major problem that we have is the intercommunication layer so and why do you need this layer because everything is talking in a different language so one solution could be something like you re-implement all the components in the same technology Okay, whatever, let's say, and right now web service is the most robust one when you talk about different languages and all. So maybe you re-implement everything in web service. Okay, in that case, you don't need the, this layer. So you would save so much of time. But what is the disadvantage that you have with that thing? What is the disadvantage that you have? Re-implement the existing ones obviously business won't encourage it because you have everything with you existing why do you want to re-implement it even you give whatever reasons you have business would not uh, agree for it because of two reasons one reason could be this mainframe components you see 
business don't want to touch it for any reason because they form the core of your business. They are coming from 40 years. They're so robust. If you change the code now in a new technology and if something goes wrong, that business goes into your mess. Correct? So that would be one reason. And obviously the second reason is cost. You have everything. Maybe you leverage it, but why do you want to write a new code? Even if business agrees for that, see today web services could be the most robust technology and we would fall into the same situation maybe 30 years after now. Because during these 30 years maybe you may acquire a few more banks with some other components. Okay, again you would fall into the same situation maybe 30 years after uh, present. Again you have to re-implement all the existing ones with the then uh, latest technology which is not a good solution obviously. So what's the other solution that we have? Maybe the other solution is not a pinpoint solution. It's basically a group of uh, concepts that would lead to a better architecture. So let's discuss about those concepts. Okay. So we'll deal with uh, one problem after other. Okay. So we have basically at a very high level we have three problems: tightly coupled nature, number of connections, and the intercommunication layer. So we'll deal with one after the other. Okay. So first we'll talk about the Archit, you are there? Yes, Shrikant, I'm listening. Okay. Am I a bit fast or uh, is it okay? Yeah, a little bit fast, but it's okay. Okay, okay. I'll be a bit slower then. Okay, you have any problem, you just uh, let me know. Okay. So we'll deal with one problem after other. Okay. So the first thing that we have here or the first thing that we will deal with is the number of connections. Okay. So too many connections is too much of maintenance and we don't want that. So what, what do you do? Uh, what might be the solution? The solution could be something like you introduce a common layer in between all the communicating channels. Okay. All the, all the communicating uh, components. Okay, now you can actually interpret uh, this in a uh, simple terms like this. You have a, you want to send a letter to your friend, okay, who is staying somewhere, say in Bombay, okay. Now what do I do? I write a letter and put it in a post box, and I really don't care how the letter goes to my friend, but my friend ultimately receives it, okay. Now who is the common communication channel here? Postal department is the common communication channel. Now how they wrote my later by Karnataka, by Madhya Pradesh, I, I don't care. Okay. So their duty is to route my letter. My duty is to write the letter. The other person's duty is to receive the letter and maybe later on reply. Okay. The same thing happens here also. The communication channel will deal with all the routing stuff. Okay. How it does routing is its own headache. Okay. Now we are not talking about implementations. Basically we are talking about concepts right now. We will talk about implementations later, but let's understand the concepts. So this communication, having a communication channel would really take out the uh, number of connections problem because that headache is taken care by the communication channel. What is it you have to do? You just have to connect it. Maybe you have to at least post a letter, right? So you have to connect to the communication channel. And if you see here, n components and n connections. It's not 2 power n minus 1, but it has reduced to n, which is a drastic change. 2 power 10 is 10, 24 to 10 connections is like 10, 1014 connections less, which is a huge advantage, right? Now, how the communication channel works is a different scenario altogether, but basically putting communication channels in between would actually uh, take out this uh, too many connections problem. Okay. And the next uh, problem that we will talk about is the uh, tight coupling nature. Okay. So right now, how are the headers or how is the request message? You would have the payload here. Okay. And in the request header, you would have the details, say component ID is uh, say some X dash. Okay. So by this address, on the letter you would have the address, right? So by this address, the communication channel would go here. Okay, everything is fine, but the problem comes when this is moved to another box. And that happens very often, right? If it moves to another box, and it will have a new host, x double dash, 
correct and obviously all its consumers have to change which is not a very good uh, case so what is the solution that we have the solution could be something like this where you maintain a registry you maintain your addresses at a single point okay and, have, and you I always have a question yes when you say it move to other box what do you mean i mean it's a third party server that's what you are telling uh it's like say you you have deployed your service uh, in a machine which is 2 gigs ram okay maybe and the load and say dual core processor and the load on it is too high so you want to enhance the uh, hardware in it okay obviously you cannot enhance the same uh, box so you are moving to another box which has say 8 core processor with 8 gb ram and you are deploying your service there got it so basically moving from one hardware to the other hardware software would be the same thing so if you if you observe the IRCTC site earlier it was very slow right now it's fast because they have changed the hardware configuration which obviously means they have moved it to another box got it it's not a third party server basically changing it from one host to another host where the other host is a much better configuration okay or maybe one other use case would be say you are using a, a provider service uh, there are so many uh, hardware providers right so you will basically pay, pay for some space and you would deploy your services and say suddenly that particular person goes out of business then you need space so obviously you would purchase it from some other company and you would host your applications there now even in this case the host changed right so basically in some way when the host changes the use cases could be n number of cases wherein you are migrating your data center or maybe you are upgrading your hardware to say an extra data machine or maybe the host uh, service provider goes out of business whatever okay is it clear? Yeah. Okay, so uh, how do you overcome this problem? You would overcome this problem by having a single source of truth and then using the logical names rather than physical names. Meaning, don't use the actual host, maybe you use a logical name for the host. Okay, so how we do, how it works is in the registry, you would register all the services. Right now, let's call it has one, two, three, four. It would be a particular name actually. This way, eight, and say its addresses here, x, y, and so on, x double dash. Okay. Actually, this would be a WSTL, but for simplicity, we are just putting as addresses. Okay. So here, uh, when one wants to talk to eight, what it does is in its header, it will have all the payload which is compulsory and say x double dash which is a logical name basically okay so this communication channel will pick the message when you give it okay then it goes to the registry and sees what is the physical location of x double dash oh, I'm sorry it would have 8 here basically the service name so it will pick the address of 8 and then it will route the message to that particular host okay now if this particular host changes meaning it is moved to another box okay it would have say y double dash okay now it is a duty of the service provider to update the registry mm -hmm. because he will only know whenever he changes right so now he has to register his new address so instead of x double dash he will have y double dash and your request even now will have the same request message you will still have 8 Okay, the communication channel goes to the registry, but now it will have a new address, so it will route the message to the new queue. So this way, the tightly coupled nature is gone. Okay, the tight coupled architecture has become so loosely coupled, wherein a change in one service is not at all affecting the other services. The service will never know that where is the physical location of the target, as well as whether the target changed or not. It really don't care. Correct. As far as it is getting the services, it really don't care whether it's given from host X or host Y. Okay, so this way by introducing the registry, you can actually 
get out of the uh, tightly coupled nature problem. Okay. So uh, we are done with two major problems and we are still left with one of the major problems which is in the communications layer. Okay, this is actually uh, taking huge amounts of time, right, and huge amounts of uh, labor and cost. So how do you overcome this? Now the problem, uh, I mean, why we have come into such situation? Because each and everything is talking in a different language. Okay, and what is this intercommunication layer doing? It's basically a set of different transformers, one for each different technology. Okay, so the, sol the solution could be if you make each and every component of the same language, you don't need a communication layer. Okay, something like this. You wrap the underlying implementation with some yeah, kind can of you please code. Repeat? Yeah. So what I'm saying is, uh, why do you need a communication? Yes. Okay. Why do we need intercommunication layer? is because everyone is talking in a different language and then the current approach for writing the intercommunication layer is it's basically a group of different transformers, right? One for each technology. So if it is to a .NET, maybe it will pick the .NET one, transform it and send it to .NET. So if it is a Java one, pick the Java code, send it to Java and so on. Okay, this is how it's happening right now and we came into this situation because uh, everyone is talking in their own protocol. Okay, because different technologies. So how do you overcome this? You could overcome this by making each and every component of the same language. See, I'm speaking French, you speak uh, German. Either we need a translator or don't talk. Okay, the, those are the only two options. And uh, so obviously we will pick up the translator and we'll talk. Now suddenly another guy with some other language comes into picture and suddenly there are so many different technologies so you need so many translators or you need a translator who knows all the uh, languages etc right so what could be the best solution the best solution is instead of having so many translators make each and every one talk a common language like english okay so that i have to talk, i have to learn only one language you have to learn only one language so everyone within the enterprise has to learn only one language, meaning everyone has to transform their protocol only once. If that is the case, meaning when you make everyone talk the same language, you don't need an intercommunication layer. Now, the question might uh, occur, how do you make each and everyone talk the same language? Just put it aside because we're talking about the concepts. Okay, we'll, we'll come into that in a minute. When you make everything talking in the same language, you get rid of the intercommunication layer. Actually, the slide is a bit different. You don't need an intercommunication layer anymore. You basically wrap the underlying implementation so that it talks the same language, okay? a common language, which is say, when it comes to software, it is basically XML because it's widely used and it's very easy to interpret as well. And it is supported by all the technologies. So if you make each and every one talk same language, which is XML, okay, or SOAP to be specific, you don't need any intercommunication layer, so obviously you save so much of money and time. Okay, so this way you can you actually make a very messy architecture into a very robust architecture. So what are the advantages of this architecture? Let's say you have a extension to be made. So what you do, you write the code, which is obvious. You have to do it anyways, and then you wrap it so that you talk the same language. Now how you wrap it is a different. Uh, thing altogether, but basically you wrap it so that it talks XML. You just connect it to the communication layer. You register it in the registry. That's all you're done. Okay. No other components have to change. Whoever wants to talk to it will uh, make their changes. Obviously, that's obvious. But see now, a simple extension is very simple to do. Okay, which is one of the greater advantages with this architecture. So this architecture would have the following advantages like a new component would have the implementation so easily. So obviously you have greater business agility meaning the business is growing even your IT also can grow on par with business. Say you want to introduce new functionalities by December 15th. Yes with this architecture you can deliver them because you need less time to do the same thing. 
which would have taken like years and years earlier. So which ultimately leads to the minimal or zero business IT gap which is the best thing to do and then you have loose coupling, lower cost and then better return on investment. Now this is something to concentrate on. So you have all the advantages but what does this talk about return on investment. So where is the investment now? The investment in is in these things, the communication, the history and the wrappers. Okay, we'll talk about uh, the return on investment in a moment but basically whatever you invest in your business, you would get returns. That's what it means. Okay, earlier thing, you're investing and you're always investing because the architecture was not robust. Every time you have to do so many things. So we talked about various solutions to make your architecture more robust. Okay, you understood all the solutions. Now all these solutions put in a more formal way. Okay, when you uh, make use of uh, technical jargons and all would make service oriented architecture. Okay, so SOA is basically an approach to make your integrations more robust. Okay, so SOA is basically an architectural style for building business applications using pluggable components which means you can plug in or you can plug out the other things won't get affected. So it's basically an architectural style, it's not a, it's not something like a new technology. Okay, it's something everyone knows Okay, it's coming from, it's not something which is uh, suddenly started in 2000. It, it is known since 1960s but thing is people did not follow it for some reasons like at that time because uh, implementing SOA would involve huge investment so people are not uh, really uh, towards investing in things that may be one reason and you don't have tools which is another reason. So basically it's not a new concept, it's basically an architectural style for building business applications. It's a standard based approach, it has to be, for integrating heterogeneous systems, meaning different technologies and all. What does SOA aim at? Extensibility, agility, return on investment and cost effectiveness. Okay, so SOA aims at greater alignment between business and IT. So all those standards that we talked about has basically given you a greater business agility. Okay, all those standards basically form service oriented architecture. It helps business respond more quickly and cost effectively to changing market conditions. So what are the advantages? The same advantages that we spoke about, greater business IT alignment, adaptability to various rapidly changing business factors, standards based approach, easier and quicker development. Turnaround time is very quick now. Uh, if the customer asks a client to do it, the client can offer very easily. Better return on investment because this involves some investment. We'll talk. We'll see what is the investment because SOA software is very costly, but you will definitely have the return on investment very easily. Better monitoring approaches. SOA even provides you monitoring approaches because as and when the business grows, monitoring is one of the major criteria, and SOA even provides the monitoring facilities. Or Oracle SOA suite in general provides monitoring facilities. So what is SOA really about? SOA is not a technology, it's not a platform, not a product or a specification. Okay, it's strictly a set of standards using which you can build your business applications in a more effective manner. Okay, so it will just tell you the standards or it will give you concepts on how to build your things. Okay, it doesn't tell you how to do it. If it tells you how to do it, it would be some specification. Correct. But it doesn't tell you how to do it, it will just tell you that you have a communication layer dot, you have a, a registry dot, you have a wrapper dot, etc. Okay. Now we are fine that SOI is about standards. It will tell us uh, about standards which makes our business more robust. But just telling is not uh, enough, right? We need to realize those concepts, meaning we need to write code. If it is just a standard, how do we realize it? If we want to do it on our own, again we come into the same old situation, meaning if you want to send a letter to your friend, you have to like create the postal department which is obviously out of your hands, correct? Okay, right? That has to be there, okay? So something has to be there which, you, which should assist you, what is that? That is nothing but the tool, okay? So using SOA tools like SOA Suite Lab NG, you have all the infrastructure in place, you just deploy, build your components, deploy and leverage all the SOA principles. Meaning you just concentrate on your business logic, 
the registry stuff, common communication channel, routing, everything is taken by the infrastructure. Okay, that way you concentrate on your business only, not the extra stuff. Argil Suvasvik 11G is a product which can be used to build SOA based application. So SOA is just a standard. So in order to realize it, we need some product and that product and one of such products is Oracle Sova Suite 11G. You also have other products in the market like from, from Tipco, uh, you have a Tipco product, you have a product from Cordis, many things, but Oracle was one of the highly successful components in Sova uh, stack. So what is Sova Suite 11G? It's a part of Fusion Middleware stack of uh, compound products. So Fusion Middleware, you're working on ADF, so you should be knowing what is Fusion Middleware. So it's basically one of the major products of SOA suite and one of the driving forces for the uh, of revenue in the Fusion Middleware products. This and the BI are the kicks in uh, Fusion Middleware. It's a next generation platform to build SOA based applications. It gives you many proprietary features apart from the standard specification. See, uh, for every technology there would be an open group, right? Uh, which, which consists of uh, so many different companies. So it could give you certain standards, meaning every SOA tool has to give so and so features, it would tell us. Now SOA suite gives all those features and apart from that, it also gives so many proprietary features. Okay, so the standard specifications are implemented and apart from that, it even provides proprietary features. Like for a simple example, the standard SOA principles doesn't talk anything about the mailing services, okay, or user message services. But in a business uh, application, mailing is mailing or SMS, whatever it is, communication is one of the major things that has to be implemented. Okay, if it is not uh, given in the standards, the tool need not implement it. Okay, so if the tool doesn't implement it, you have to implement the mailing infrastructure, which is very tough to do. Okay, so SOA suite gives such implementations out of the box. Okay, it has so many proprietary features, like you just drag and drop a mail component, you'll have everything set up for you. Okay, so that's the advantage of using the SOA suite because it has almost equal number of proprietary features to the standard features. That's the reason developers, uh, developers life is made so easy when you use a SOA tool which is like Oracle SOA suite. It's, an, it's a platform on which Fusion applications is based on. So Fusion Applications is like a successor to EBS, obviously after all the acquisitions and all. And all the integrations in Fusion Applications is done by SOA Suite. So when it goes into the market, I mean last year it went into the market in 2000, in end of 2011. So obviously the market is growing uh, for Fu uh, Oracle SOA Suite. As soon as the customer implements Fusion Applications, they need a SOA consultant. No doubt in that. So what are the underlying technologies or what are the prerequisites? Now here we come uh, to one of the important things. You initially told about your expectations. See for learning SOA, having a basic understanding on these is more than sufficient because you never write code on your own. Okay, it's, everything is configured. Okay, you just drag and drop and then you configure things. Now why don't you write the code because writing an XML is one such headache that even a small uh, tag would create a lot of problems. That's the reason everything is made design oriented. Okay, you, you concentrate on your work. Now the underlying things are automatically done. So XML and the XML schema is what you should know. I think you should already know what is an XML and what is schema. A basic understanding would be more than sufficient. And then coming to web services, Web service is a way of communicating over the web using a standard protocol. And this is the basic definition of web service, but basically it involves three different technologies, SOAP, UDDI and Bistrip. Okay, SOAP is, uh, when I say I am talking in English, right? So two components talking in web services, talk SOAP. Okay, it's basically the language in which they transfer the message. UDDI is basically a registry, description, discovery and integration. And then Bistrip is a description document. Meaning it's like a menu for your service. Say I'm providing a service, okay, so I would have a visitor, which I will give to all my consumers. So my consumers will look at the visitor and they will understand, because obviously I cannot give my source code, right? I'll give the visitor, which is like a menu card, 
So they will see whatever services they want. They will pick those services and write the code. A visual has information like what is the protocol to be followed to invoke my service, what are the security requirements, what are the inputs and outputs, what are the various functions, etc. Okay. So everything, uh, nothing you would write on your own, but it's always good to know the underlying implementations, right? That's the only reason I, I pick up these as the uh, prerequisites for the course. So if you're not aware of it already, then maybe go to w3schools.com, which gives you a, a brief understanding of all these concepts. That should be more than sufficient, okay? Because we would not write any web services on our own. So these are the various underlying technologies. And coming to your question on whether we will work on web services here or not, maybe uh, I will answer you or you will understand it by the end of second session because there I'll explain you where web service really stands and why web service is different from so on. Okay. But coming to the previous pieces, these are the ones that you need. Okay. Just a basic understanding what is so, what is UDDA. Even if you don't know the web services, you could be a very hot SOA consultant. But when something goes wrong, like you get a error at a very basic level, then you need to uh, like dig out, right? In the in such cases, uh, understanding on this would really make sense. Okay. And after this course, I can work as a SOA consultant. Yes, straight away. Because, uh, I mean, why I'm saying that? Because it happened uh, with me also. So initially, I was a Java consultant. I mean, I was a Java developer. I learned SOA and I came into the SOA projects. I mean, it's an internal transfer out of the question. But basically, uh, I didn't find any problem. I was deployed into a Bipel project, okay, which, is, which is kind of a good step for transforming into SOA applications. And I didn't find any problems with that. Because whatever we do now, see, end of uh, one month, whatever I do in the class, you do it yourself. First time maybe watching through the video and after that maybe without watching. You understand the concept and spend a little time, maybe one hour a day, uh, on going through the concepts. Uh, I'll give you various differences for each and every topic. Because obviously we cannot cover the whole thing in a class, right? So there would be some things which I would give references to. And if you spend one hour a day, uh, maybe after 30 days, you would be a very good SOA consultant. So uh, the advantage with SOA is that everything is configuration, right? So you need to know what to configure. Okay, if you know what to configure, meaning let's say you want to send out a mail. How do you send out a mail? You need to know that, meaning you need to drag and drop a mail component you have to know that there is a mail component somewhere. Okay, If you know such things, that should be uh, sufficient. And obviously your functional consultant will tell you what to do. He tells you send a mail to the admin. So drag and drop a mail component and configure the details of the admin. That would do things like that. When you go through the course, you will slowly understand uh, the various aspects of it. but uh, take my word, SOA is very easy when when you compare it to the other technologies because one advantage is everything is configured and the other advantage is we look only at the integration level. Okay, it's a, a SOA consultant would look at the integration level. He would not look about the implementation levels of the uh, at the implementation levels of the services. Services would be given to you by the Java team or maybe whatever technology team and. Uh, where SOA is really uh, used is uh, integrating different applications. Applications are sold out of the box, right? Say Primavera. Primavera is a portfolio management tool. Or say HCM, Fusion HCM, to be very uh, specific. Okay? It gives you all the applications and each and every functionality is associated with the web service. So right now, every uh, vendor of an application, whatever it is, they are providing web services out of the box. So web services are readily available for you. The only thing that you need to do is to integrate things. And to integrate, you need a SOA tool. Okay, that's where web services come. Web services are already there. You need to pick those web services, use them. Okay. So that's all for today. Any questions?
maybe end of tomorrow you will have uh, many more questions. Tomorrow what we will do is we will talk about what are these things. Okay, so even tomorrow's approach would be the same thing. We would take a live example like an expense report system, okay, which involves so many different things, okay, and we will see how it really works and where each and every component fits in, so that you will understand what is a mediator, what is an adapter, why people, etc. Okay, so end of tomorrow you will have a clear understanding on what are the various components Oracle Source which offers and what is it we are going to learn in the course. So maybe you can just go through the video if you have any questions or maybe we can meet tomorrow. Is that fine? Are you able to hear me? Uh, now I could hear you but earlier it was very low. Achit, you are there? Hello? Hello? This seems to be there, but is uh, like maybe that sound came right, so you got disconnected or something because of internet. Okay, anyways, uh, we're done with the session, so let's meet tomorrow at the same time. Yeah, sure, she can't. We'll meet tomorrow, then she can't. Thank yeah, you, guys. Thank you. Bye.